we are going to record this session as well and put it up for those who maybe want to go back and review if I uh, go through something a little bit too fast or they just need a second look at it or for somebody who wanted to attend but maybe couldn't. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Anthony Keach. I work with Academic Technology Services. Uh, we've been pretty busy over the last few days, as I bet y'all can imagine. And one of the big ways we've been busy is getting people up and running with Zoom. So Zoom is the ETSU web conferencing platform. We've had it for about a year. Uh, I personally think it's a really good one. I think it's the best one we've ever used, and we've used several. Um, and this training is designed to be a little bit shorter, and it's to get people who are very new to this system or maybe to web conferencing in general kind of up and running quickly. So we're not going to do a deep dive into a lot of separate tools. This is the basics, the fundamentals. Um, we'll talk a little bit about some resources you have if you want to go a little bit deeper. And after the training, I'm not going anywhere. I'll hang around. So if you have a specific question about something you've seen uh, or want to do in Zoom that I didn't cover, just ask me, no problem, and we'll go over that. Uh, also, this is interactive. Um, I know that you guys have the ability to talk, and Linda, you're in on the phone there. So if you have a question about something I am going over, uh, this is real informal. Just yell it out, and we'll, we'll take some time and go over it. Does that sound good? So the things that we are planning on looking at today are um, creating meetings and managing recordings within the Zoom web portal. And that's going to be important because we're going to see there's a whole bunch of different ways to get into Zoom. Uh, but there's one way that I think is, is the best, or if not the best, at least the most full featured, and that's the Zoom web portal. We're going to talk about hosting Zoom meetings, um, what to do inside a Zoom meeting. What I'm going to try to do in that way is to share my Zoom screen with you through Zoom. So that's going to get a little bit a little bit weird because uh, you're going to be seeing two. The Zoom screen you're in as a participant, and then you're going to see mine as a host. Uh, hopefully, we can get that to work here in a minute. Um, we're going to look at the D2L Zoom integration. So if you are teaching a course through D2L, uh, we've got a good integration with Zoom, and it makes things a lot easier. Uh, and then we'll just talk about some general questions you might have, some resources, and some support. Um, we're going to jump to the end and talk about one website that is a very, very good resource if you haven't been there yet. It's um, etsu.edu slash Zoom. So if we lose connection, if you uh, have to drop out for any reason, uh, or if you don't understand what I'm talking about, maybe you want a deeper dive, this is pretty much the only thing you need to know because this will not only give you the link to log into Zoom directly, the correct ETSU Zoom portal, but it will also give you a bunch of guides and resources that we've put up that you can view asynchronously at your own time, including a new comprehensive look at Zoom. So something that goes much, much deeper than this um, uh, kind of getting started workshop we'll go into. And that is up at etsu.edu slash Zoom. So I recommend uh, bookmarking that. If that's, if that's the one site that we go over that you remember, that's the best one. So what does it mean to have a Zoom account here at ETSU? Zoom is something that people can sign up for for free. So if you've got family out there that are not connected to ETSU, they could go get a Zoom account right now, but it's gonna be very limited in what they can do. So a Zoom account is limited to 45 minutes for groups of three or more. So if you have more than one other person in there, you're gonna be limited to 45 minutes. And there's a couple of other limits in there and how many participants you can have, uh, how many meetings you can have, and recording is limited greatly with the free account. But everybody at ETSU has ready for them to activate a Zoom Pro account. That includes faculty, staff, and students as well. So everybody with an ETSU at EDU email address can activate their Pro account. Notice that I said it's ready to activate because you don't actually have a Zoom account until you log in to the Zoom web portal. And we're gonna look at how to do that here in just a minute. There are no limits on the number of meetings you can create. And the participant limit for one meeting is 300 people. That's pretty big. So we've got five people total in our meeting right now. Imagine this with 300 people. Uh, I'm not saying that's a good idea. That'd be pretty chaotic. But from a technical standpoint, you can have up to 300 people. Uh, we also have a cloud recording available. And that's a really, really nice feature because Zoom does a good job with that. We're recording this to the cloud right now, meaning that as soon as I am done with this meeting and in this meeting, it's going to process a cloud recording. That can take a little bit of time, especially with the strain that Zoom is under right now. 
Uh, it may be anywhere from two hours to 24 hours before that video is ready. Um, most of them aren't taking quite that long, but we've seen a few that are, that are taking a while to process. It's also going to automatically generate an audio transcript, a caption file, which is very good for accessibility reasons. That is processed separately, so it takes a little bit more time. So if you get your video in two to three hours, maybe four to five hours before you get that audio transcript. Once it's there, uh, any participant or any viewer of that video can turn on captions and it will be accessible. We'll talk a little bit more about that and where to find those recordings and how to manage that uh, when we get into the web portal. But our cloud recording space, it's, it's not unlimited. So Zoom is not a video platform. It's not a host for video files. Mm -hmm. So it does uh, auto delete the recordings after a certain amount of time. So it's very important to know if you've got this fantastic recording uh, of a session that you did in Zoom, maybe you were the only one in the meeting and it's a completely asynchronous video, or maybe it was this great guest speaker, something like that they will be auto-deleted after a certain amount of time. So if it's something you want to keep, you'll want to download that video to your computer. It'll download in a very common MP4 format. You can then turn right around and upload it to something that's um, more long-lasting, a better video host, something like YouTube, uh, OneDrive, Stream, Tegrity, any of those will work better in the long run. Right now that uh, limit uh, of time before a recording deletes is set to one year, 365 days. So you've got plenty of time. Uh, but if you're anything like me, it's easy to forget. You put a recording up there, you share it with people, you get busy with everything going on, and then it deletes a year later. I said there were a lot of different ways to access Zoom, a lot of different access points. Um, and that can cause a little bit of confusion even though it does give us a lot of options. So people might decide to access Zoom uh, to get in to create meetings or to join meetings through a client, uh, which other people might call a program. This is available on PC or Mac. It's actually what you are in right now as you're listening to me. You're in the Zoom client, uh, either uh, on a PC or a Mac, or, or a mobile device, which we'll talk about. So everybody ends up in the client, but that's not where we necessarily recommend you start. Though you can jump into the client without going to the web through a browser at all, and you can do simple things like create a meeting, join a meeting, uh, even share your screen. Um, people might be on a mobile device, like an iPad, a tablet, an iPhone, uh, an Android phone, and they have their own dedicated apps that participants could download. And it works pretty well, and, and the uh, apps look very similar to what they would look like uh, on a computer. They can share their screen, they can join with video and audio, and they've got a lot of different options there. But what we're going to really focus on today is this link right here, um, HTTPS, colon slash slash etsu.zoom.us, etsu.zoom.us. That is the ETSU Zoom web portal. That's where you'll log in if you want to create a meeting, see meetings that you've created, see the recordings that have uploaded to the cloud, or manage anything that way. Again, this link is linked right off of this guide page, etsu.edu slash zoom. They sound very similar. If you can just remember this edu slash zoom page, you've got everything you need. But one of the things you'll need is it's gonna link you to this site right here, etsu.zoom.us. Don't forget the ETSU because the zoom.us will work and that will take you to Zoom's standard page. So if you have a Zoom account through them, a personal account through them, maybe even a free account, that's what you'd log into there. But your ETSU credentials aren't going to work unless you're at etsu.zoom.us. The reason we're talking about the web portal so much is that's where you have far more options. We're gonna get into some of those options now. And I think it's the best, most consistent place to start. However, if you do like the clients and you log into a Zoom client, you may see a screen that looks a little bit like this here on the right. And it's very easy to just start typing your ETSU email and password over here on the left-hand side. But that's not what you wanna do. Since we go through single sign-on, it's gonna use our ETSU credentials, the same credentials we'd use to get into our webmail on the browser uh, at ETSU uh, or other things that use single sign-on. So what we wanna do is we wanna come over here to what's circled in blue and say sign in with SSO, that stands for single sign-on. That will point you to the right credentialing area for your ETSU login. 
it won't work if you do it here on the left. Now that's again only if you're inside a client or an app, but sometimes you might find yourself in those and you want to remember to sign in with SSO. If you go in a browser to etsu.zoom.us, you'll know you're in the right place because you'll see our campus here in the background and you'll see the ETSU logo above the Zoom. So it's a little bit different than the Zoom landing page. You have two options here, join. Anybody can join a meeting in progress. It's not gonna ask you to log in and you don't have to have ETSU credentials in order to join a meeting. Let me say that again so it sinks in. You don't have to have ETSU credentials in order to join a meeting. Um, so anybody can join a meeting if they have the correct meeting ID. If um, you've got a guest speaker, if you've got peers at another institution, if you've got anything like that, then you can um, invite them into the meeting. They can come here, they can hit join. My little robot vacuum cleaner just went off. I tell you, working at home is full of surprises. I don't know what's going on. All right. Um, but if you hit the sign in option, it is going to challenge you for your ETSU credentials. So your ETSU credentials will be two factor authentication. If anybody's tried to log into their email at webmail.etsu.edu from home, it's going to be the same thing. Uh, and you're not going to be able to get into the web portal as a host without signing in through those credentials. That means, and this has caught me before, that you're going to have to have your phone or whatever you use for two-factor authentication near you if you're not already logged in to your home computer. So don't leave your phone in one room and then try to go start a Zoom in another because it's going to send a text or use the Authenticator app or however you do it to that phone and you're going to need that in order to log in. Very, very important there. Once you are in the Zoom web portal, you're going to see a screen that looks a lot like this. On the left hand side, you're going to have some options. The first one's going to be profile. There are a lot of options in Zoom and we're not going to go into every single one of them today, but I'm going to point out some very, very important ones. Uh, the first one here is your profile picture. Normally that's kind of a vanity uh, item, but here it has a little bit of extra import because if you change your profile picture or include a profile picture and you're not sharing your video, that's what it's going to default to is that picture. So I have the ETSU logo as my picture. I'm going to stop sharing my video for just a moment. If everybody can see my video, when I stop, it changes to that logo. That's the profile picture I uploaded. So if it was your, uh, you know, your ETSU faculty picture or whatever it might be, um, that's where your, yeah, April's showing hers right now, so she's got her picture right there. So it's got a little bit of extra import to put a good picture up there, um, besides just being a nice thing to do. You can see Tammy and Linda there as well. They have not added a profile picture, so it just shows their name, and there's no problem with that either. Uh, it's going to show the name there. We'll get into this a little bit later when we get into a meeting, but people can rename themselves. So if it doesn't have the name that you like, you can change that inside a meeting, unless the host has re removed that ability. Um, and it pulls our names by default from Banner. So that's where they get it. So if, um, if you're William and you go by Bill or something like that, you can rename it here in, in Zoom inside the meeting. On this same profile screen, you're also going to see your personal ID, your personal link. And um, we've got ours blurred out right here. That, oh, sorry, right here. Um, that personal ID is very important. And you want to be careful who you give that out to because it's kind of like your home phone number or your address. Once somebody has that, they can come into a personal meeting with you at any time. You may not be there. It may just be an empty room, um, but that is best shared with people that you know very well and you meet with very frequently. I haven't found a great use for my personal ID yet. Uh, it's not something that I normally give out. And we'll talk about what we do recommend to create a meeting here in a little bit. But be careful with that personal meeting ID um, because it's not something you can turn off later. It's kind of a eternal reserved room for you open at all times. You'll also see if I come kind of back up here over on the left hand side, you've got this settings option on the left hand side settings. And there are a lot of really powerful settings in there. Most of them we're not going to go through right now, but do know that you have a, a lot of agency with these settings. Um, 
So the admin team went through the settings and tried to pick defaults that were going to be best for people teaching a synchronous class, a faculty member teaching the students. But there are a lot of other good uses for Zoom besides just teaching. You may be using it for interviews, you may be using it for uh, advising or um, thesis defense is a big one we've seen or maybe a guest lecture or maybe you're using it by yourself uh, alone just to create an asynchronous video and all those are very very appropriate uses for zoom so you as we start creating meetings you may come in here and start setting some different defaults and as you find that you're setting them again and again and again you may want to come into this settings panel and change your specific defaults forever and that's absolutely fine to do We also have a meetings tab on that exact same page, meetings right under the profile. And this can show us a few different things. It can show us a, our upcoming meetings, anything that we've scheduled or has been scheduled on our behalf. We can come over here and start them if we want. It doesn't matter if it's set for 5 p.m. We could start it early uh, at any time. We've got previous meetings. So you wanna go back and look at the details of a meeting that's already happened, you can do that. Again, there's that personal meeting room. Wouldn't recommend using that too much unless it's somebody you're meeting with an awful lot. Uh, we're not gonna get into meeting templates. That's a little bit more of a deep dive. We are gonna talk very much about scheduling a meeting, joining a meeting in, um, up here in the top right in just a moment. So, okay, I guess we're gonna talk about it right now. So if you want to start a meeting from this page. Again, we logged into etsu.zoom.us and we're looking at the options here. One of the most important options up here is schedule a meeting. If you select schedule a meeting, you're gonna get some options that look like this. And if you schedule a meeting in uh, the app in D2L, when we start looking at the D2L integration on a mobile device, doesn't really matter. All these options are very, very similar no matter where we're starting our Zoom meeting from. We're gonna have a topic meeting and a description. Uh, the topic is just the title and you'll find that a lot of these settings are very, very similar to setting up a, an event in an Outlook calendar. So same kind of thought process goes into this. Your topic, everybody's gonna see, that's the title of your meeting. Your description is optional and I usually leave it blank, though you can put a description in. And um, if you do that, it's really only going to be seen if you require registration. And we'll talk about that down here in just a little bit. Um, but I find that the description doesn't pop up in a whole lot of places. So I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time crafting this really, really great description unless you're going to use registration. Just one second. The uh, time, we've got our time, uh, start time, date, duration, and time zone right here. Again, very similar to a, a calendar app. Under the when, we can choose the date, then we can choose the time. The duration throws some people off. You can set it for an hour, hour and a half, whatever is appropriate. But know that this is just information for your participants and it's approximation. It's not going to lock you into when you start your meeting or when you stop your meeting. So if I set this for an hour, but we really got going, I could go hour 10, hour 15, hour 20. It's not gonna stop the meeting and it's not gonna stop the recording. So this is, uh, this is just information, it's not a hard cutoff. Of course, you wanna be in the right time zone. Oh, there we go. And you can set this to be a recurring meeting, almost exactly like a calendar invite. So if I wanted the same meeting to happen, maybe I'm setting it up for a class and this is my lecture. I could set it for 8.15 in the morning on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I could repeat that all the way up until um, maybe the end of the semester, I could give it an end date, something like that. Again, very similar to a calendar in that way. The registration options. It, this can add a little bit of a barrier for those who are trying to get into your meeting, but it asks to collect a little bit of information about who's joining before they come in. You guys should know this because I set the registration to on for this uh, particular meeting. And I think it asked your name, your email, things like that before it gave you the link in order to join this meeting. I wouldn't recommend doing that for a class or for a, a, a quick meeting with colleagues or peers, maybe a staff meeting, anything like that, because it sets another barrier up and I usually don't need to have detailed information of who's coming. It is really good for trainings or one to many webinar type situations.
trying to mute before I cough for you guys so, so you don't get blown out. Um, I also have a schedule for option. Now when you're in Zoom in the web portal and you're creating a meeting, you may not see this right away and I'll explain why. But this essentially allows me to schedule a meeting for somebody else who's given me that access. Uh, so if April gave me the ability to schedule a meeting for her, I could go in and I could fill out all of these details and set up a meeting, but April would be the host of that meeting, not me. So it's very similar to a, an aide or, or somebody who's helping coordinate things, set up a meeting on your behalf in a calendar invite, very similar to that. Somebody has to grant you the option to schedule for them. And if you don't see this, this option here, it's because nobody has given you that privilege quite yet. Below that we have meeting ID, we can generate automatically, or this is an option where we can use our personal meeting ID. But I, again, would not recommend doing that if you don't have to, or if you're not comfortable with that. I usually go with the uh, automatic generated meeting ID as it's temporary and will be deleted 30 days after the meeting is over. I'm gonna jump over to a browser so I can show you a couple more options that weren't on that slide. Can everybody see my browser on the screen? Is everybody seeing that? It says Zoom up in the top. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so again, just filling out this meeting, I could type all this stuff in. But I wanna show you a couple of other things that throw some people off. One is meeting password. So you can require a password when you set up a Zoom meeting and somebody would have to have that password in order to join. Usually it's a very simple set of numbers. Please do remember to share that with them so that they can get into the meeting. And if you're worried about security, so if you set it to generate automatically a meeting ID, that's a random number in itself. So somebody's gonna have to know that, somebody that you share it with, or if you create this through D2L, your students will have access to it. Um, so that I think is already a pretty good way of keeping people out of meetings. I've never had somebody who wasn't supposed to be in a meeting jump in. Um, now watch it happen today in some way, but um, haven't had that happen yet. But this is an extra little level of security. Of course, if somebody has your generated meeting ID and shares that with somebody else, they would be able to get in. They would also be able to easily share this password as well. So it's not linking to like a single sign on authentication to get in or anything like that but it's there if you want it. This video option here, um, this can throw people off as well. A lot of people look at these options and think that they're, in this particular case, turning off the ability for participants to use their video. And that's not what this is saying. This is setting the initial default state when people come into the meeting. So this only matters for the first second when somebody comes in. In particular, this option that I've got set when I come into the meeting as the host, my video is gonna be on automatically so people can, can see me right away and, and know that I'm present and know that they're connected well. But it's going to keep the participant video off by default. They can still at any time choose to turn their video on. It's not taking away that privilege. It's just not starting, starting by default for them. And I find that this is my favorite setup when starting a meeting. If you're having a very small group of, of colleagues or peers and you meet with them all the time, you could probably turn this on for both. And as soon as everybody hops in, they'll see the, uh, uh, the other person's video. But if I'm connecting with students or people that I don't know, I don't want to start the video by default and them not realize that, especially if they're starting to just get settled and sitting down and shuffling papers and they're not quite ready yet for the meeting. Uh, I like to give them the power to turn on their video. So I like to go with this setup, but you can set this um, for any meeting individually. Audio, this option is one of the very few that's locked in Zoom, you can't change this. Basically it gives everybody the ability to join either with the telephone for audio or computer audio, a microphone and speaker setup like I'm using here. Uh, this can be a really powerful option if anything throws off your speakers and microphone for a second. In fact, we saw Linda connecting with her audio earlier, and I don't know if she just didn't have a microphone or maybe it was giving uh, some issues. Maybe the internet speed wasn't very good, but she was able to call in with her phone, and you can see that happening in, uh, uh, in the participants bar there. Uh, it's a great option for people. This gives them a lot of flexibility. 
I want to spend some time talking about these last five options because these can really uh, get you in trouble if you don't know what's going on. The first one says enable join before hosts. So I'm setting up this meeting. I'm going to be the host of this meeting. But if I leave this checked, it means that as soon as I share out that invitation with people, either through email or a news post or a text or however I get it to them, they would be able to join the meeting, come in, uh, talk amongst themselves. And basically, it's like coming into an empty classroom. And nothing's going to stop them from doing that. They, they can't hurt anything, but they could have the meeting pretty much without me, without any host being in there. Mute participants upon entry. Again, this is very similar to the video option we talked about up here. The mute participants upon entry is not stopping anybody from using their mic. It's just muting it by default when they first come into the meeting. And again, I think that's a courtesy. It can also save you if you have a large group. If you've got 10, 15 people coming in and you leave that unchecked and everybody's coming in, getting situated, knocking into their mics before they're really sat down and still, it can create a lot of ambient noise. The waiting room, this is an interesting kind of lobby-like purgatory area and it can cause a lot of confusion where somebody will enter the meeting, but they're not really fully in the meeting until the hosts allows them in individually. So this is appropriate if this is a very secret meeting, it's, it's maybe it's an interview or a thesis defense and you don't want anybody coming into the meeting that you aren't aware of. But it does mean that the host really has to be paying attention and allowing people in. It's like somebody will come to the classroom door and knock and the host has to allow everybody in. Very rarely is this a good option to turn on unless you really need a lot of security. Only authenticated users can join. I spent some time earlier saying that Zoom can allow anybody to join. They don't have to be an ETSU person and they don't have to have a Zoom Pro account. But this would remove that option. So if this was checked on, only people with a Zoom account could join my meeting and they would have to be authenticated before they came in. Again, not a whole lot of use for this option. And this bottom one can be a little confusing too. Record the meeting automatically in the cloud. If I turn this on, the second that anybody joins my meeting at any time, it's going to kick off an automated recording. This is fantastic for people like me who never, ever, ever remember to hit record in their meeting if I want it to record. I always miss the first 10, 15 minutes of a meeting because I forget to hit record. When I turn this on, and I usually do, I don't have to remember that. It's going to record everything that's happened in this meeting from start to finish. Here's where we can get into a little bit of trouble, and we'll look at this again when we get into D2L. If I have enabled join before host, and I have record the meeting automatically in the cloud. If both of those are checked, then let's say April wanted to test this link before the meeting began. So it's started at 2.30, but maybe 12 o'clock. She just wanted to make sure her system was up and running, her Zoom was uh, updated, and her microphone was working. So she hit that link and she got in early. She could do that if I had enabled join before host, no problem. It would also have kicked off an automated cloud recording if I had this started as well. So I'm going to get a message in a little bit that says your recording is done and I'm going to go, what in the world happened? And I'm going to go look at that recording and it's going to be April for about 30 seconds sitting there in front of her camera uh, testing her microphone and that's the entire recording. And while that isn't a big problem, I can just delete it. Just know that having both of these options selected can result in a lot of small uh, kind of false positive recordings that aren't really what you want it to have for your meeting. So generally what I recommend is select one or the other of these options, but don't turn them on both at the same time. Uh, or if you do, just be ready to have potentially a lot of cloud recordings coming in because it will happen every time somebody jumps into your meeting. And the final option I want to talk about is the alternative host. If I was to put an email of somebody who's activated their Zoom account into this uh, this field here, they would act as an alternative host. They could start the meeting for me. Uh, again, I said my internet went out earlier. If I thought there was going to be a problem with my connection and the meeting really had to go on, I could reach out to a colleague. I could make them a, an alternative host here. They could start the meeting and run things just as if they were the host, even if I was not here. So this is a good thing to put in for somebody uh, who may help you with the meetings you're going to run. I'm going to pause there for a moment. That was a big chunk of information. Any questions at all 
about setting up or scheduling a Zoom meeting or any of the options we talked about? Hey, Anthony, I have a question. Sure. Um, so you went over, uh, you said meeting templates would be another time. Is that where you change your background? No, um, we can take a second to look at that when we get into the meeting. I'll go ahead and tell you, it's a good question. So the meeting templates uh, are really for people who set up meetings for other people and they do the same type of meeting a lot. They create a lot of different meetings. So they may always have this unchecked and always have these two checked or whatever their particular setup is. They can save that as a template. And that will come in every single time when they create a meeting, they can choose that template. So maybe I would have an office hours template and a lecture section template. And those have very different options. Does that make sense? It's basically saving a set of options. Good question, April, thank you. Okay. Yeah, okay, let's look at this for a second. So let's say that I've, I've created a great meeting here. Everything's set up exactly the way I want. Everything looks good. I'm gonna go ahead and hit save down here at the bottom. And I'm gonna come to a screen that looks like this. And basically this is summarizing all the information that I already have uh, put into that meeting. It gives me a button to start the meeting if I'm ready to go ahead and do that. Although I scheduled this for the future, so I'm probably not ready to start it yet. What I need to do is allow people to get into it and they don't know that this exists and they don't know what to click on or how to get in. These two options here are gonna be key to solving that. Invite attendees. First, there's a join URL. We'll come back and talk about that in a second. And then there's a copy the invitation link. So if I click that, I'm gonna get a little pop-up with all kinds of different information here. In fact, sometimes it's a little bit too much information. This is everything somebody would need to know to join my meeting from just about any situation possible. It's gonna have the topic that I chose. It's gonna have the time. It's gonna have a link in it, join Zoom meeting. It's gonna have the meeting ID. That's very important. And if I had a password on there, it's gonna put the password. If they can't log in with computer audio with their mic and their camera, it's gonna have the phone numbers they can call if they want to call in with a, an actual phone. And then it's got some extra information here that most people, 99% of people aren't ever going to need. Join by SIP and join by H323. That's for these big web conference rooms that have these big proprietary systems in them and need to connect that way. So most people aren't gonna need that. I can copy this meeting invitation and that is what I would paste into an email that I was sending out to people or if I was in D2L and I wasn't using the integration, <coughs> excuse me, uh, I would paste this in a news item or a content item or something to draw their attention to it. But the most important thing is that link. And that's why that link is also right here in the join URL. I could text somebody that link and that's all they need in order to join the meeting. It puts in all this separate information for them. So very, very good there. So I'm gonna try something a little bit weird now. See if I can get this to work. I'm gonna stop my share. Give me one second and I'm gonna to try to share my Zoom screen itself. This takes a little bit of finagling. Okay, I'm gonna try it one more time. Okay, can everybody see inside their window, can they see my window and I have several people kind of galleried around, you see April there and Tammy and Linda. Does everybody see that? Okay, this is gonna be interesting. You're looking at my Zoom window from the aspect of a host. So I'm in this meeting and I'm a host and I'm gonna walk you through some options. You have some of these options as participants but you won't have all of them. Uh, unless you're a host until you create your own meeting. So I'm just gonna start down here at the bottom. This is, this. sorry, this is uh, the Zoom client. This is what you'll see once you hit start a meeting or if you're a participant, which you guys are right now, uh, if you join somebody else's meeting. Notice that I'm no longer in a browser. This is in its own window, its own program. Uh, we call it a client or an app. And my screen may look a little bit different than yours, depending on some options that I change. Notice that when I change to a speaker view, 
it doesn't change everybody else's screen, it just changes mine. So you as participants have some options there as well. But I'm gonna start in the bottom left. You guys have these options live to you right now as participants, and they're some of the most important. The bottom left, I see a little microphone. Mine's hopping up and down right now because I'm talking and it's giving me some visual feedback that it is uh, receiving information from my microphone. If I was to click this, and I'm gonna click it right in just a moment here, uh, you're gonna see a big red line come through it and it's gonna be a big visual indicator that I've muted my mic. So nobody can hear me if I've hit mute here. Um, this is a big problem that we run into with Zoom is that in, in many ways trying to be helpful, a lot of microphones through Windows or Macs or even laptops, they have about 40 different places you can mute them. So I'm, I've got a microphone and it's got this, it just came with it. It's got this little uh, remote control as part of the cord and I can mute my mic there. And I could unmute here in Zoom all day long, but the microphone's still not gonna send any information. And this is one of the number one things that we end up troubleshooting is people just don't have their mic plugged in or the right mic selected or it's muted somewhere else besides Zoom. Uh, it, it can be very confusing if you're not used to using microphones with your computer. The same option is over here to the right, stop video. If I click that, again, you can continue to hear me, but my live video went away and it was replaced in my case by a profile picture that I uploaded. If you weren't using a profile picture, it would just have my name there. And if I click it again, I pop my video right up. So know where those are at all times. You can mouse over them real quick. You can mute your microphone and you can stop your camera if you need to. Each of one of those options has a little up arrow, a little carrot to the right of it. It can be a little bit easy to miss. And if I click on that, I'm going to get a variety of different options. Since you're on different computers, your options may look a little bit different than mine. But essentially, this is allowing me to pick if I have multiple microphones or multiple uh, speakers on my computer. So right now you can tell that the microphone I'm using is on this, uh, this headset guy that I've got right here. I also have a webcam going and it's got a microphone in it. If I needed to switch to that really quick, I could. I could just select it right here. And then the microphone wouldn't be coming out of this anymore. It would be coming out of something else I have attached to my computer. You guys may only have one option and that is pretty normal and that's fine. But this is great if you have more than one option for either a microphone or your speakers. We also have a test speaker and microphone option. I'm not sure this is gonna share. Yeah, okay, it's sharing. Um, this is also very, very good for any of your participants, especially students who may not be used to this system to do, right as they're entering a meeting um, or if they're having any problems with their mic or, or their speakers. So right now it's saying, do I hear a ringtone? Of course, I've got headphones on so you can't hear it, but I do hear this ringtone, so I would hit yes. But if I couldn't, if I see this little line going up and down and I couldn't hear anything, I would hit no. And it's gonna start automatically cycling through all the different speakers I have attached to my device. So very, very good little troubleshooting there. I do hear it, so I'm gonna hit yes. And then it's gonna say, um, speak and pause. Do you hear replay? And I can actually hear myself speaking right now. So I know my microphone is working. Can everybody hear me now? During my test, I, I said no, so it tried to look for a different microphone and turned it off. That's what happens when you're doing this on the fly. Uh, but that test can be very, very important for figuring out troubleshooting, which if you have 30 people joining your meeting and half of them have a little bit of a problem with their microphone or camera, that's not Zoom related, it's just they, they're not really sure it's set up correctly, it's gonna take your entire meeting time to try to troubleshoot all of those different people. Uh, of course, you can send them over to IT help or something like that, but then they're not getting any value out of the meeting. Uh, so just that little test speaker and microphone. Anytime somebody sees that option pop up, I do recommend that they take it. It's going to be very, very powerful. But if the speakers and microphone aren't working at all uh, or something happens and, and the internet goes out, something happens and it just fails, again, you can pop in here and you can switch over to phone audio. And then I could just dial a phone number on my phone and I could listen in. Even though I'm interacting on the computer, I could still see the visual information. People would hear me as I talked into the phone and I would hear them as, um, they would hear me as I talked through the speakers in the phone. 
These same options are here with video. There's a little bit less of them, uh, but if you have multiple cameras attached to your system, then you can select them there. Moving along the bottom, again, you'll have some of these options as participants, but I have a few more as a host. I have an invite option. Maybe I didn't grab that invite link, that very important link when I created the meeting at first, or somebody sent me a message and say, hey, I, I'm late to the meeting. Can you help me get in? I can do it straight from the meeting. I can hit invite here. I could invite somebody that's on my contact list, or I could hit either copy URL or copy that invitation. If I hit copy that invitation, I could paste that again into a message and let them come right in uh, immediately to the meeting. There we go. Besides invite to the right is manage participants. And again, you can click on that yourself and you can see a list of participants live in this room. But what I see, oh, Linda, Linda did the audio test before entering the meeting. It was successful. Not sure why it didn't work when I entered the meeting. Uh, it may be the internet or even Zoom is struggling right now. It's, this meeting seems to be going okay, but, um, but it is under a whole lot of strain right now, Linda. That, that may have caused some problem for you completely outside of your equipment. Notice that up here on my list, I see some visual information right away. So I can tell that um, Linda is not in the audio on her computer because it doesn't have a microphone next to her name, but it does have a camera. So I can tell that she's connected to the camera. I can tell that April is using her camera because there's not a line through it, but she's not using her microphone because it's got a line through it and it's muted. So there's a lot of good visual indications right next to everybody's name. By my name, I can tell that I'm the host. I can also tell that my microphone's active, my camera's active. I can tell that I'm recording this meeting that's the little cloud with the red dot that's blinking. I can also tell that I'm sharing my screen. So at a glance, I can tell a lot of information about who's doing what. And it can get a little chaotic. If you have a bunch of people in a meeting and you've let a student share a screen, maybe they're doing a presentation for you, sometimes it can, it can get a little funny and you're trying to figure out who's sharing what and who's doing what. As I mouse over people, I'm not touching anything, I'm just mousing over people, I get some options that you guys may not have. I get an unmute option. So April's not sharing her microphone right now. I have unmute. If I was to select that, April's microphone would not just automatically turn on. I do not have the ability to turn on anybody's microphone or camera, nor do I want that ability for privacy reasons, for legal reasons. I don't want to be able to turn on your stuff. What it would do is it would send April a message that says, hey, the host would like you to, to speak, would like you to turn on your mic. Would you do that now? And you get a yes or a no option. So you, any participant has to agree to turn on their microphone. And the same is true with their, with their camera. But I can mute anybody. So if April is uh, turned on her microphone and she's just having this great conversation with all this music blasting in the background, she's having a great party over there, but it's really adding a lot of noise. I could come up here and I could hit mute real quick and shut that down. And usually where we see that being important is if several people are talking at once or somebody has started up their microphone with a lot of noise in the background or there's that feedback going on. And I'll mute somebody real quick and then we'll maybe chat or, or release them one at a time in order to figure out what's going on. Everybody next to their name when I mouse over has a more option. And when I select more, I get a few different things. I can start a chat directly with somebody and we'll look at chat here in a second. I could stop their video, just like muting their microphone. I can't start their camera, but I can stop their camera. So if something vastly inappropriate started happening in the background, I could quickly come over here and stop a video so nobody could see that. I could also spotlight a video. This is important, especially if you have accommodation needs. Maybe I have a guest speaker or I have somebody in the meeting who's doing uh, interpreting sign language, something like that. And I need that video to show all the time, no matter what, no matter who talks. I don't want anybody else popping over that. I would come over and I would spotlight, in this case, April. If I spotlighted April, no matter how much I jabber on, April's gonna be the video that shows. Was anybody able to catch the board meeting yesterday? Um, we had a Zoom board meeting and it was important that the interpreter who's doing sign language show all the time so people who couldn't hear could get a visual translation of what was going on. We spotlit that video, so that's how it stayed up. 
I also have the ability to make a person a host or a co-host. If I make somebody a host, I will not be the host anymore. I will be a regular participant like everybody else. So it is handing over that entire privilege to somebody else. I would do that if I was gonna step out of the meeting and not be involved anymore. I could also make somebody a co-host. So a co-host has almost all the same privileges as a host, but they can't remove the host. Um, they can't kick the host out. This is good if you've got a guest speaker or somebody, something like that that's gonna come in and they're going to um, pretty much run the meeting, but you still need to be there in the background kind of as a coordinator. I can rename people. So when you logged into Zoom and joined this meeting, it asked for your name. It probably filled it in by default with whatever it pulled from Banner, but you could type over that and you could add just about anything you wanted from a nickname to something uh, completely different from your name. So if, um, if I needed to, I could rename somebody here. Oh, I'm gonna see this. Where are you doing this? I still see the Brady Bunch view. So yeah, um, I'm over on the right-hand side of my screen. You're, you're right to see the Brady Bunch, but over to the right of that, there is a per white participants list with uh, my name, April's, Tammy's. It can be a little confusing because you might see two of them. You might see it on your screen and you might see it with my share window. Is everybody seeing that participants list here? And as I mouse over it, you'll see kind of a blue button pop up over people's names. Linda, I want to make sure you're seeing that. Had to move your video. Perfect. Okay, wonderful. I'm glad you. I'm glad you said something. Yeah, it pops over here on the right. Um, and if you watch for a second, if I hit manage participants, so now they go away, and I don't have anything on the right. And when I click, it comes back. So if I have my screen all the way over to the right, and then I hit manage participants, it may pop up off screen. So that's that's a good good point. That issue might help other people. Linda, thank you. Uh, let's see, under more options, again, I can rename people. I can put somebody on hold. This is a really nice option. We saw this really come into play when somebody was doing a thesis defense in Zoom and the student was there presenting their defense and then there was a committee that wanted to somehow get them out of the meeting for a little bit so that they could deliberate on the defense and then they wanted the student to come back. They were asking the student to leave the meeting and count to a certain number and then come back and it, it, it wasn't very official. What they really needed was this put on hold option. So Linda, I wanna make sure you can see that. Uh, under more, I can put on hold. And what that will do is it will send them to kind of an empty room where they can't see or hear me. And we as a, as a committee could discuss them in privacy, but they haven't left the meeting fully. So I'm gonna pick on Tammy here. I'm gonna take Tammy and I'm gonna move Tammy. I'm gonna put Tammy on hold. And on my screen, you can see that Tammy is now up here. It says one person is on hold, they're kind of grayed out. And the only option I have is to take off hold. So I brought Tammy back and Tammy did not hear any of my explanation when she was in hold. So wasn't be able to hear that. Now do keep in mind, I just wanna remind you that I'm recording this meeting. So even though Tammy was in hold for a few seconds, anything I say in the meeting that's being recorded, if Tammy has access to that recording, she can go back and watch later and hear everything we said behind her back. Finally, I can also remove. So I have the option to remove somebody. This is if they're really not bringing any value to the meeting or if they're not supposed to be there, or I don't know who they are, I can kick them out of the meeting and they will not be able to return. Uh, unless they go find a new computer and log in with a different name. Any questions about managed participants? That's a big chunk of, of running a meeting and it can, uh, it can be a little overwhelming. Okay, I'm gonna skip over polls for now, kind of like uh, templates. That's a little bit more of a deep dive. I'm gonna come to share. Share is what I'm doing now. You can see everything on my screen. It's very simple. If I hit share, I don't know if it can share the share window, but you should see uh, several different options of what I could share. And it's going to give you any options of applications that you have open on your machine, plus the full screen. No problem, April. See you later. So I can share any of these options 
or I could just share my entire screen. I usually just share my entire screen, and if I do that, anything that I have on the screen is going to be available for anybody to see. So it's important to close anything that is very personal. Maybe you have your email up in the background. Just be aware of what's going on on your screen before you start a Zoom meeting, because you may be asked to share your screen. And if you do, and then you get a personal email that pops in or a notification or something like that, everybody in the meeting is going to be able to see it, and the recording is going to pick it up as well. But it's very easy if you have to jump between a lot of different content that you want to share. For example, I wanted to share my PowerPoint. So there's my PowerPoint still. I want to share my Zoom window and I had a web browser up earlier that I was going to share. So if I'm sharing my screen, I don't have to remember to stop the share and then go share a different application. I can just bring it up on my screen and anything I see, everybody else is going to see as well. The chat feature, we're already in there chatting and it's working pretty well. Uh, if you select chat, you can see very, very basic chat tool in Zoom. At the bottom is where I can type my message. And by default, it's gonna send that message to every single person in the room. But I do have some granular controls over that. So if I say hello, instead of sending that to every single person in the room, I can select just Tammy or just Linda. Linda, I'm gonna say hello privately. You can see on my screen, it gives me a red indicator that this is a private message to Linda. Only Linda saw that message and Tammy did not. Do be aware that there's small little icons. Hey Linda, thank you. Small little icons next to where I can type and that gives me some more control as the host over my meeting. Let me pull this up so I can see it a little bit better. I have the ability to save this chat. Maybe there's some really good discussion with my class there and I wanted to save it. Uh, I can also limit what people can say to each other. So right now, everybody can chat to everybody in the room and they can chat privately. So Linda, you and Tammy could have a whole conversation behind my back that is allowed right now. And I would not be able to see that at all, nor would any recording capture that anywhere. It's truly private. But maybe I don't want that to happen. So I could select everybody publicly. That means everybody can speak with the room, but they can't speak to each other privately. I could also say even more than that, I want only people to be able to, to communicate with me. Maybe it's a one-to-many situation where I don't need everybody trying to answer everybody else. So I could say host only, or if I don't want the chat option at all, I could say nobody. Nobody can chat with anybody else. And that's gonna basically turn chat off for the remainder of that meeting. My options down here may look a little bit different than yours. Essentially, these are my recording options. I'm right next to the chat feature, still at the bottom of the screen. Since this meeting is already being recorded, I have a pause feature and a stop feature to manage that recording. If we need it to take five, I need to go get a glass of water or we were gonna have a little bit of a study break in the middle of a class, something like that. But I want the recording to continue later on, and I don't want to mess with two recordings. I'd rather just have one recording. Then I would select the pause option here. It's going to temporarily stop that recording, and when I hit resume, which this button will become resume once I, uh, once I pause, then the recording is just going to pick up, and I'm still just going to have one recording file at the end of this meeting. However, if I was to hit stop recording, it would immediately start processing that recording. And if I hit record again, this button would become a big red record button. If I hit record, it's gonna start a brand new recording and I'm gonna get two files, one for the first part of the meeting and one for the second part of the meeting. Breakout rooms and reactions are another uh, kind of deep dive thing that is usually not the most important. And we're gonna skip over that. I'm gonna go over to more. Uh, and again, you probably won't use this option a lot, but you could stream it to live, uh, stream it live to YouTube if you so want. Going all the way to the right here, I have an end meeting option. As a host, this is pretty important. If I selected end meeting, I'm going to get a little pop up. If I didn't mean to select that, I haven't canceled the meeting obviously yet. I could hit cancel, no harm, no foul. But I have two other options. I'm not going to click either. In fact, I'm going to keep my mouse away from them so I don't accidentally do it. I can leave the meeting. And if I leave the meeting, it's going to assign somebody else at random a host because I haven't selected a, a new host. If I was to make Tammy the host, I could then leave the meeting and she would be the host and continue on. But if I didn't select anybody, it would randomly pick a host. 
So Linda might be the host and I may not have intended for that to happen, especially if it was a room full of students. Or if I really want this meeting to be over, as the host, I can select end meeting for all. And that's essentially gonna hang up the phone on everybody. It's gonna kick everybody out and the meeting will be over. So I'll go ahead and cancel that. A couple of other uh, odds and ends that can be very helpful. As you're the host and looking at somebody's video, anytime I mouse over a video, I can come up here and mute the video or I can get a couple of other options. We saw a lot of these options over here in the manage participant window, but you can get to them here as well. So you can quickly find somebody whose video may be going and you don't want it to, and you can get to these options, including put on hold. Um, I can even hide non-video participants if I've got a lot of people in the room and I just want to see in this grid the people who are sharing their video and participating, I could do that. Uh, somebody else mentioned the Brady Bunch view. That's kind of what it feels like right now. Zoom calls it a gallery view, and I can do this on my end without it affecting you. And that's up here in the top right corner right next to the full screen button. So if I click speaker view, it's going to show one big screen of whoever was talking last ex besides me, and everybody else is going to be small at the top. If I click gallery view, it's going to take as much screen as I have and it's going to divide it equally by all the cameras up to 49 cameras. So we said that there were 300 potential participants in a Zoom meeting, but it can only show 49 cameras at one time before you have to page over to a different page. That's still a whole lot of cameras and each, each one would be really small at that point. And uh, Zoom itself and the internet might be uh, stuttering a little bit at that point, but from a technical standpoint, you can do that. I'm going to switch gears for a little bit here and talk about Zoom as it looks inside of D2L. But before I switch over to that, are there any questions about anything that's happening inside of this Zoom meeting as a host? And you can speak up or you can throw it in chat. Either way is fine. Okay, I'm going to stop the share for a minute and I'm going to switch it back so you can't see my Zoom meeting. Okay, and once again, I'm sharing my screen and hopefully you can see my PowerPoint. I'm gonna get out of that and I'm gonna go over to a web browser. And I'm going to jump into D2L as an instructor. So if you're teaching a class through D2L, you may have noticed a different option show up in all of your classes if you're using a standard nav bar. So if I jump into one of my classes here, that's a real class. I don't want to do that. I'll scare my students. There we go. I'll jump into this development. Notice now that an option has been there that hasn't been there before unless you have opted into Zoom over the past year. It was opt-in for quite some time. With this current situation, we have turned this on by default. You can opt out. So if you have a D12 class, especially if it is already completely asynchronous and it doesn't make sense to have a Zoom link in there, you don't want your students creating synchronous meetings and you're not intending to use it, we can turn that off and I can send you a very, very short video on how to do that. It's very, very easy. Um, but as default, now every class has a Zoom link right inside of D2L. And this is just going to look very familiar to some of the other things we've already seen. If I select Zoom as either the instructor of the course or as students, let me see if I can uh, make this a little bit smaller for you. There we go. I get a little Zoom window inside D2L. Notice that I have not left D2L. I still have my normal course home content, et cetera, tools at the top, but now I have a Zoom web portal inside of D2L. And I could do some pretty typical things with this. I can schedule a new meeting and that's going to look exactly like it did when I scheduled it through the web portal or pretty much anywhere else. I get those same options down here like require um, a meeting password, enable join before host, everything like that. 
The difference is any meeting I schedule through the D2L integration is going to pop up right here for all of my students to join without me having to send that invitation to them. So it makes it very, very easy for me to set up a meeting and for my students in this particular class to see it and to join it. <clears throat> I have other tabs here at the top. I can see previous meetings that were set up within this D2L account. Uh, again, I can use my personal meeting room. I wouldn't do that inside a D2L account. And I can see cloud recordings. Any recordings that I've made from any of my meetings inside this D2L account will automatically populate here under this cloud recordings tab. So at its most basic, if you create a meeting through D2L and make a recording through D2L, it's gonna show up to all your students and it's the easiest way to get them the information. But there is something I want to point out before I suggest to doing this for every single situation. Any meeting that I create through the Zoom link inside D2L is going to be public to every single student on that class list. I can't create a meeting for a specific student to say, talk about their grades or maybe a concern that they had with, um, with an assignment or some feedback I gave. That's a meeting I would want to remain private. If I set that meeting up here, any student would see it. Any student would be able to join it from this class list from D2L. And if I created a recording, any student would be able to see that recording. And that's very, very important to remember. Remember, I also said that students have full pro accounts to Zoom as well. There's nothing stopping them from coming into your Zoom area in your D2L site and scheduling their own meeting. They may think they're scheduling a meeting to just meet with a small group. Um, maybe you're having some group work done or they're going to work together on an assignment. But if they schedule that meeting, again, everybody in the class is going to be able to join it and everybody in the class is going to be able to see that recording. So in short, to sum up, if it's appropriate for the entire class to participate in both the recording and the meeting, create it through D2L. There's no easier way to do it. If it's something that needs to be a little bit more private, just with a few students or with one particular student, go back to that web portal and create it there, just as we talked about, and then send them the link through an email or whatever means is necessary for you. Does that make sense to everybody? I wanna make that warning clear. That's really all there is to the D2L integration. It's simple and easy to use and it's very powerful, but it's limited in those privacy controls. And finally, I want to hop back over to our web portal. Again, we get here by going to etsu.edu. No, I'm sorry, etsu.zoom.us. And I can see my profile. I can see a variety of different things. But what I want to point out here is the recordings tab. We skipped over this earlier. And this recordings tab is where I'm going to see any recordings that I've made through a Zoom meeting. So I have several here. It gives me a date range if I need to narrow that down. Here is a meeting that I created earlier. And here is the meeting that we are in right now. And notice that it's still processing and recording because that recording is still happening. I'm still making it. And as soon as I hit stop, it's going to continue to process for a little bit longer. And then that recording will be here. I can share it easily with people. This is a meeting from earlier in, to, in the day. If I hit share, I can grab the link right there and I can put it into D2L or send it out via email uh, or Slack or, or whatever communication means I'm using. We said that they're not out there forever and I can tell at a glance how much longer this video will be up. Since this one was made today, it's got a full year, 365 days left on it. But this one was made uh, a little bit earlier. This was made in January. So it's only got 304 days left on it. So this way I can tell exactly when my videos are going to be deleted. And if it's something I want to keep, I can download that. I can do that by coming over to more and downloading the file. Again, it's an MP4, so it's very easy to re-upload to YouTube or something like that. Let's see if I do a... I can also download it from inside the recording. And if I play this recording, notice that I can come over here and there's some scissors. 
Zoom has very limited editing abilities in its cloud recordings, but you can trim both the beginning and the end of a video by using these scissors here. And it basically allows me to set a beginning point and an end point to these videos. Ah, oh, there's me from, from earlier. That's a non-destructive edit, meaning that if, uh, if I make those changes, but then I decide that I, I cut too much, I can come back and I can always change them again later. But that's the limit of its editing capability. I can't add something into the middle, create a new audio track, or cut something out of the middle either. So that's pretty much the bulk of what I wanted to show you. We do have a little bit of time left. I wanted to make sure you are aware of, again, these resources that we've gone over. ETSU.zoom.us, that's the Zoom web portal. That's where you're going to log in and create your meetings and find your recordings. ETSU.edu slash Zoom, that's probably the best resource on campus for Zoom right now. And it will link you to ETSU.zoom.us. So again, that's the one to remember if you don't remember anything else. ETSU.edu slash ATS, that's where you can find us. You can find our contact information. We're at home, but we're still working and we're very happy to help you with anything that you need in here.